Hey there everybody, you know what time it is. It's time for another Strange and Bizarre Cases compilation. This is where, about once a month, I take a bunch of cases that I found while researching that aren't really long enough to be their own video, but are definitely interesting enough to have their own spotlight. So, let's get right into it. This one is... Police officer nicknamed Lesbian Nana investigated over pepper spray incident. During our last compilation video, we featured a story of the lesbian grandma, a police officer out in the UK who tends to go on a bit of a power trip. Well, not long after, members of my Discord informed me that she has been in the news yet again for once again getting into some shenanigans. To summarize the last incident, the police were called to take care of a drunken autistic 16-year-old girl and drive her home for her own safety. When they got her home, the girl told this particular police officer that she looked like her lesbian grandma. The officer, who we will be calling lesbian grandma from now on as her name has not been made public, didn't respond to this very well. She and her fellow officers decided to arrest the girl for making what they called homophobic remarks. They manhandled her, took her out of her home, and threw her in jail for a whole day until they let her out. Needless to say, it was a PR disaster. Well, lesbian grandma is now in the news once again. It all started when West Yorkshire police stopped a local resident due to some suspected traffic violations. After, residents of the Rothwell Council estate came out and surrounded the car, arguing with the police. This was when none other than lesbian grandma whipped out a big old can of pepper spray and started dousing the locals while screaming war cries. Once again, a video was taken of the incident that subsequently went viral on social media. In the end, three police officers ended up with undescribed minor injuries and two men were arrested on the spot. However, police weren't really happy with LG's actions here, leading to a referral being made to the Professional Standards Directorate to look into her. The father of one of the men who got pepper sprayed is now furious and calling for Lezzy Granny to get fired once and for all. Hundreds of other people across social media are calling for the same. The man's son was one of the two men arrested at the scene, arrested on suspicion of assaulting police officers, possession of controlled drugs, and possession of a knife and offensive weapon. He was released shortly after. The father said, It's not right. You see that copper. She's been reported before. She wants sacking that woman for what she's supposed to have done to that autistic kid as well. She definitely wants sacking. A neighbor of the council estate says that the police definitely aggravated the situation and should have been a little more mindful while conducting such affairs in an area where they are not so liked. Again, the police released a statement about good old Les Ma, saying, Leeds District CID is continuing to investigate the incident which occurred after 5 p.m. on Sunday, October 22nd on 3rd Avenue in Rothwell after a car was stopped by officers for a suspected traffic offense. As is standard, following any arrest where force is used, the body-worn video of the attending officers will be reviewed in conjunction with social media footage. Any breaches of the standards of professional behavior identified will be assessed and dealt with in line with police conduct regulations. Now we've got NHS failings enabled necrophiliac murderer to offend for 15 years, inquiry finds. Cannibals and necrophiles, here we go. We're hitting the gauntlet of all things disgusting today. So this is a case that began in 2021, but is still currently ongoing. It is the case of a man named David Fuller, a hospital worker at the Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells NHS Trust out in the UK between 2005 and 2020. This man is believed to have been the worst necrophile killer in all of Britain's history, having alleged to have abused the corpses of more than 100 women and girls over a period of 15 years throughout his workplace. This was due to what an inquiry has called serious failings by the NHS. Police raided his home and found more than 800,000 pictures that he had taken of his activities over the years, along with some 500 videos. Not only that, but they found material that suggested to the police that he had a keen interest in the abuse of living women as well. Not only that, once caught, David admitted to murdering two women in addition to the many, many bodies he partook in over the years in hospital mortuaries. In 2021, he was arrested, jailed, and given a full-on life sentence. During his trial, he fully confessed to killing both 25-year-old Wendy Nell and 20-year-old Caroline Pierce in two separate attacks back in 1987. Then, he admitted to abusing the bodies of dead women anywhere from age 9 all the way up to age 100 over a period of 15 years. 
This case prompted a massive two-part inquiry, as this man had gotten away with this for years and years, right under the hospital's nose and effectively the NHS. Sir Jonathan Michael, the chair of the inquiry, said, Over the years, there were missed opportunities to question Fuller's working practices. He routinely worked beyond his contracted hours, undertaking tasks in the mortuary that were not necessary or which should have not been carried out by someone with his chronic back problems. This was never properly questioned. More recently, Sir Michael has said, The offenses that Fuller committed were truly shocking and he will never be released from prison. Failures of management, of governance, of regulation, failure to follow standard policies and procedures, together with a persistent lack of curiosity, all contributed to the creation of the environment in which he was able to offend, and to do so for 15 years without ever being suspected or caught. It seems that there was very little concern with who had access to the mortuary, with David having visited at least 444 times in one year despite it being outside of his job description. Not only that, higher-ups in the facility had known that there were problems running the mortuary from as early as 2008 and didn't care enough to do anything about it. The inquiry outlined 17 recommendations designed to prevent something like this from happening again. Obviously, CCTV cameras were recommended to be installed in the mortuary and staff were suggested to enter in pairs. A second inquiry was launched in order to investigate how people who have died are treated all over the country, focusing on safeguarding private mortuaries as well as ambulances and funeral homes. That will likely continue until sometime in 2024. The Trust Chief Executive, Miles Scott, said that he is deeply sorry for the pain and anguish currently being experienced by the families of David Fuller's victims. He said that the Trust would implement the suggested changes as quickly as possible. Next we've got Idaho Cannibal Charged After Cops Find Microwave Body Parts. It's not often that we get a cannibal story on this channel, but it does happen more often than you'd think, or more often than you'd expect at least. This one all started when some police found some partial human remains in a car parked outside of a local residence on September 10th. This home belonged to a 39-year-old man named James David Russell. Police naturally got into the home and began a search, wondering why this guy had some body parts in his car. Inside the home, they found a glass bowl, a knife, and a very bloodied up microwave. They also found more body parts inside the home, along with what they called a thermal artifact, which showed that heat was applied to a portion of the remains and not the entire body as a whole. James had used some sort of cleanup kit in an attempt to destroy some of the evidence of the crime, which he succeeded in doing to an extent as some of the remains have yet to be found. Still though, there was more than enough evidence to arrest him with what they had. James had killed and murdered a 70-year-old man, David Flagett, in September. As you might have assumed from the headline, he did this in order to consume him. According to a local newspaper, James had done so because he believed that he could, quote, heal himself by cutting off portions of flesh to cure his brain. Due to this, the police believe that the still missing remains may have already been eaten. James was taken into custody on a murder charge, but since then a charge of cannibalism has been added to the list. This case is actually the first cannibalism charge to ever take place in Idaho, according to Bonner County detectives. They said, There's a lot of facets we will certainly never know. It wasn't the bloodiest crime scene, but it's more of the psychological, what the heck is going on here and why am I picking up pieces. It's a walk down the dark path that we don't see very often. Court proceedings were halted when, understandably, James was ordered to undergo a psychological evaluation. It appears that he'll be getting a review. And here we've got Alan Mann caught with 58 terabytes of CP sentenced to 35 years. The kids aren't really catching a break today, and I'm sure it's going to be up for debate which of these cases is actually worse. Now, this is a crime that I can't mention on YouTube without getting in trouble, but it's pictures of kids. CP. You know, I'm sure you get it, so let's move on. A detective with the Plano Police Department in Allen, Texas, was conducting an investigation in internet programs known for trading this specific brand of illegal material. This was when he found a certain user making a whole lot of material available for download. Let me make this clear, it was an absolutely insane amount. While no human being should have any of this material, this guy had an amount that is so astronomical that it isn't even clear how one could possibly find so much. Over only two days, the police department found him to have uploaded over 4,000 images to file sharing programs. After an investigation, this man was found to be 41-year-old man Richard Denver Belden, a resident in Allen. 
Members of the sheriff's office got a search warrant for Richard's apartment, and upon entering, they caught him right there in the act, both downloading and uploading the material to his laptop. Not only did they take said laptop, but they also found 15 other hard drives amounting to 57 terabytes of storage. In case you don't have a good grasp of how large a terabyte is, all of the material for my YouTube channel, including uh, drafts, videos, and the source material, only has amounted to a little over 2 terabytes in the last 4 years. I would have to run this channel for over a hundred years to amount to the same amount of space that this guy had dedicated to CP. Just let that sink in. Richard was arrested and pled guilty to charges of receipt and possession of CP and later sentenced. The trial took a few years to complete. In the end, he was sentenced to a total term of 35 years in prison with 20 years of supervised release whenever he gets out. This was about the highest recommended sentence he could get. The judge has said that his character played a big factor in getting the high end of the deal. The prosecuting attorney said, These type of cases show the real depravity of parts of our society. We are fortunate that law enforcement is out there looking for these people. You hearing any day now. We'll just have to see what happens. Here we have Porsche driving investment banker is charged with sucker punching 16 year old girl. Where would we be without Florida man stories in these compilations? I mean, I don't even look for these. They just come up and they come up really often. Well, here's one from Hillsborough County out in Tampa. This particular story started when a 47-year-old self-employed investment banker named Stephen Irwin Sanders supposedly got cut off by another car. The driver of this other car was an anonymous 16-year-old girl, allegedly driving out in front of Stephen's Porsche 911. Stephen flew into a rage and decided to get some revenge. He followed the girl's car up to the next stoplight around Florida Avenue North. This time, he drove out in front of her and cut her off. He then got out of his car to go and confront her. He ran over to her car, screaming and ranting such things as, What the fuck are you doing? And you stupid bitch, you cut me off. Then this 5'11", 200 pound man baby clenched his fist and punched the 16 year old girl straight in the face. She was left bruised, red, and sore all over the left side of her jaw. Steven then got into his car and fled the scene, but luckily the girl was able to remember the distinct design of his unique looking black and white Porsche with a big 911 printed all over the driver's side door. The police were able to track him down, and after seeing the license associated with the vehicle, they felt they had likely found their man. The court documents stated, Based on the investigation, the suspect unlawfully entered into the victim's occupied conveyance and committed a battery upon her. Stephen Saunders was arrested on December 18th and charged with burglary of a conveyance with assault or battery. According to the Hillsborough County Court System's website, this is a felony that is punishable by life, crazily enough. On the 18th, he pled not guilty to the crimes. Afterwards, he was released from the county jail on a $15,000 bond. Stephen's attorney has said that there are more details to the story that will come out over time, explaining why this man decked a young girl. He said, We'll let the court process play out, and there's more to the story. You can quote me on that. This one is, Tampa woman posed as homeschooled 14-year-old to molest middle schoolers. It's Florida again, and not only is it Florida again, it's also Tampa again. You know, what can I say? I feel like we can't go even one month without someone being oddly horrible to kids, but here we go. A woman named Alyssa Ann Zinger, age 22, was arrested very recently for engaging in, at the least, 30 sexual activities with a student and sending very adult explicit videos of herself to several others. While that's definitely skeevy enough on its own, she did it through truly unusual means. Alyssa created a bit of a persona to use online, mainly on Snapchat, but also on some other platforms, where she pretended to be a 14-year-old homeschooled girl in the local area. It seems that multiple boys at Wilson Middle School in Tampa's Hyde Park neighborhood fell for the ruse and were more than happy to engage. She was able to meet up with one of the boys back in May and started a, quote, relationship, if you want to call it that, up until September. This boy, although his age hasn't been revealed, would have been anywhere from 12 to 15 when it occurred. He told the police that the two had intercourse multiple times on top of trading a lot of nudes. To other victims, Alyssa openly admitted over Snapchat to engaging in these activities with other minors as well as the previously mentioned boy, although their identities are still unknown. 
When arrested, she tried to fool the police as well, desperately saying that she had a younger half-sister with the exact same name as her. They could find no such sister on planet Earth. Police had already been on her trail for quite some time, actually. She had been arrested for shoplifting during the summer as well, which didn't really help matters. Alyssa was charged with two counts of lewd and lascivious battery and five counts of lewd or lascivious molestation on a victim between the ages of 12 and 15 years old. She decided to plead not guilty to all her charges. She was released only one day after her arrest after posting a $7,500 bond on each of her charges, both of which were second-degree felonies. The police have since said, It is disturbing and unsettling to see an adult take advantage of a child and prey on them. Anyone who may have been a victim of Zingers, we encourage you to come forward. The Tampa Police Department will support you and ensure a predator like Zinger doesn't cause you or others additional harm. There are believed to be additional victims. And now we have... 11-year-old Brownsville honor student was put in solitary confinement. Here we have a truly bizarre story that is honestly unlike any other story I've covered to this point. Here we have the story of an 11-year-old boy named Timothy Murray. Timothy here was an honor student, winning various awards for science projects, science fairs, coding programs, and chess competitions. One of his last big projects was with his father shortly before he passed away. After his passing, Timothy decided to speak up and request counseling for himself at his school, Palm Grove Elementary School in Texas, at the start of fifth grade. For some reason, the principal, Murder Garza, didn't take kindly to this. Shortly after, school administrators pulled Timothy out of class and told him that another student was claiming that he made threats against him. Timothy denied this, but the principal then called the police on him. They detained him and put him in solitary confinement for three whole days at Daryl B. Hester Juvenile Detention Center in Brownsville. Cameron County prosecutors attempted to push for felony charges of terrorist threats, arguing that he be locked up for another two weeks. The judge found all of this incredibly bizarre and instead ordered it to be released back to his home and undergo a simple safety risk evaluation rather than lock him up and throw away the key. Timothy's family felt that this was nothing short of some extremely strange retaliation against him for seeking counseling. Although that assertion was pretty wild, they couldn't think of why else this possibly might have happened. Timothy didn't do anything else. He was far too timid and serious of a student. Experts have come to say that the Brownsville Independent School District and the police have violated various state laws and other rules throughout this case. Laws that are intended to protect kids that age. They had not even conducted a fact-based threat assessment around the incident in order to show that there actually was some sort of credible threat in the first place. Not only that, but a minor isn't even allowed to be in solitary confinement for more than 24 hours. The detention center said that he was left in there due to COVID concerns. Runeka Reej, a policy advisor at a nonprofit called Texas Appleseed, says, This was the choice of the school to refer to law enforcement, the choice of law enforcement to detain the child, the choice of the prosecutor to charge him and try to trump up the charges. All of these things are failures in serving young kids. The Observer, a local paper, requested info from the superintendent and the principal of the school. The only response they got was from the Director of Public Relations and Community Engagement, who said, This case has been transferred to the Cameron County Juvenile Justice Department and is pending education. Brownsville ISD cannot comment any further on this matter. Now we've got, High school basketball player and family beat coach in parking lot after being benched during game. Well, here's a case that kind of sums itself up in the headline. For those of you who played high school sports, I'm sure you understand that being benched is a feeling that really sucks, but would you really go out and beat up your coach for it? Well, that's what's happened here. This happened when a Texas boy named Jevin Allen, 17, was benched during a basketball game after showing bad behavior to a player on the opposing team. Something that infuriated both him and his family, who, I guess, thought he should be able to be as unsportsmanlike as he pleased. The high school coach, after the game ended, returned to their home school at about 9.52 p.m. This is where he came to see both Jevin and his whole family waiting there for him in the parking lot. He walked past them and went into the school. After he came out, he was surprised to see that they were still waiting there for him. The boy's relatives first confronted the coach, cussing him out and berating him for benching the boy. Then things really got out of control when Jevin sucker punched him right in the face. 
This was when Jevin's older brother, 22-year-old Jarek Allen, jumped into the fight as well, with the two beating him all over until several bystanders and another coach came in to break them up. The assault left the coach with injuries to his neck, arms, face, and head. The police were called and deputies were sent out to Willis High School. Police got a hold of the CCTV footage and interviewed various witnesses, which were all in line with what the victim had claimed had happened to him. He also had the injuries to back it up. Both brothers fled the scene shortly after the attack. It didn't take too long to track them down, and they were both arrested and charged with assault on a public servant. After posting a $23,000 bond each, both of them are released from the Montgomery County Jail shortly after. The coach is now recovering from his injuries while Jevin no longer attends the school. It seems that the whole family has packed up and fled the area, with police saying. The investigation is ongoing, but we did determine that the student's address was no longer valid, so he has been withdrawn from the district. We are deeply saddened by this incident and will not tolerate this behavior from students. Alright, this one's a doozy. Raunchy, alcohol-fueled Taco Bell party included open sex lawsuit claims. I think it's safe to say that everyone out there loves Taco Bell, but some people might love it for reasons other than what you might imagine, such as the orgies. It seems that a former employee at a Taco Bell restaurant in LA is suing both the franchise owner and the company as a whole after a Christmas party at the location that she says included a drunken mess of burrito-filled, alcohol-fueled, gassy orgy. This woman, Alana Betcham, has officially filed her lawsuit with the Los Angeles Superior Court. In her suit, she says that her supervisor invited her to a Christmas party on December 18th of 2022 being held at the San Pedro Taco Bell where she worked. She was told to bring some food for the occasion, so she decided on some guacamole. When she got there, she found it quite odd that her supervisor had covered the windows of the establishment with wrapping paper, but being Christmas, it wasn't fully out of the question. What was weirder was that they had also covered the cameras in the lobby. She said that the supervisor then provided alcohol to all of the workers, saying that many of them were, in her words, overserved. After a few hours of partying, Alana decided to step outside for a bit and get some air. When she came back in, she found her co-worker having sex with his wife in front of everyone at the party while onlookers cheered on. This wife was even kissing the female manager and another female co-worker while doing the deed. Alana ran out of the establishment, but then thought, oh shit, my guacamole, can't forget that, and ran back inside. Then she saw that several of the people getting it on were now vomiting all over each other. One of them threw up right into her guacamole bowl. Alana says that she then reported the incident to HR, who I'm sure had a bit of a field day with this one. She then reported it to the franchise based in Colorado. The manager and all of the co-workers involved were fired shortly after. Someone, likely one of the disgruntled firees, shattered Alana's car window shortly after and she began to receive threats against her life. Instead of doing anything to the people who had threatened her, Taco Bell and the franchise just transferred her to a new location. After a while though, she just quit. She says that she has suffered, quote, actual, consequential, and incidental financial losses as a result of the drunken Taco Bell bang fest. A Taco Bell spokesperson has since said, while we don't own or manage this location, the franchisee who owns and operates this restaurant has shared that they take these claims very seriously. Now we've got Taiwan Man Fined for Calling Woman Cart Titan on Social Media. Here we have a rare case from out in Taiwan, and the subject matter of the case is even rarer. Like some other countries in Asia, you can actually get punished for bullying on social media, and you might even get a fine for what you say. That's where this case comes in. Taiwanese media reported on November 21st that a man is facing both a lawsuit and a fine of the equivalent of about $380 for posting some less than complimentary comments on a woman's social media post. On this post, the man compared her to that of a monster from the Attack on Titan series, which oddly enough has come up in a different video I made, a monster called the Cart Titan. If you haven't seen the series, the Cart Titan is a giant humanoid horse-like creature with a very elongated, goofy-looking face. It's likely not the type of anime girl, yeah, it's a girl that you'd like to be compared to out of all the options out there. It has a reputation for having both one of the funniest and ugliest designs in the series, especially when compared to the much cooler looking titans out there. The woman took action against the commenter, filing a lawsuit against him. 
Another man bandwagoned on the original comment, also adding some what they called sexual implications as well, which got him an even worse fine of $790 and 25 days of jail time. The public in Taiwan was generally more in support of the insulted woman, finding the cart titan quite ugly indeed. Her lawyer commented that the court found the action both malicious and defamatory, legitimizing the lawsuit claims. This case has now become somewhat of a meme throughout the country, with fans of the series proud to exclaim that the cart titan has now reached court-approved levels of ugliness. Here I've got a good little bonus story. Florida man caught feeding wild alligator resists arrest. So what do we have here? A little bit of a redemption arc? Are we finally going to wipe the Florida man slate clean? Well, let's find out. Here we've got a story of a Florida man who resisted arrest for possibly one of the best reasons ever. This guy here, a 67-year-old man named Paul Fortin, was feeding a 10-foot-long alligator in his neighborhood pond, causing him to come back time and time again. He says that the alligator is both a good boy and a good friend to him. It seems that a neighbor saw a video of Paul feeding the alligator on Facebook one day, got butt hurt, and reported him to the police. The cops came out and gave him a citation for feeding the gator boy. Paul apparently thought this was stupid and refused the citation. The police insisted he take it, but he refused, notably without violence. Paul was interviewed by News 6 when he said, He's a good boy. He lets me pet him. He just sits there and he loves bagels. He was such a good friend. When speaking of the legal ramifications of doing such a thing, he stated, It's illegal. It's totally illegal to do it. Did I know it? No. Did I know I couldn't feed a turtle? Alligators? Yeah, I kind of knew that. I don't know. Maybe I'm a Dr. Doolittle. Once again, everybody, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please give it a like. It really helps me out in the algorithm. And feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I post these compilations once a month. If you want, go ahead and follow me on social media, because if anything were to ever happen to this channel, that would probably be the only way you'd ever hear about it again. If you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I always keep linked down in the description below. There you can buy videos early, ad-free, and uncensored. And channel memberships are back up too, where you can get the same benefits. This has been your host Kyle, thank you, and good night.